Well, um, the book this talk is based on was written long before the start of the 2020 pandemic. However, I think you're going to see similarities between the lockdown, attitudes towards the infection, and even the symptoms between COVID and the Great Plague in 1665. At the end of this talk, I'll explain how I've put this story together. It's an account, account of Cambridge in crisis and the people involved. And one thing about um, history and people, what we need to remember is that these people were just like us. They had the same emotions, the, the same feelings, um, the same ambitions and aspirations. And um, all these people who were involved in the plague were just ordinary people. So the day is 25th of July, 1665. A small boy, John Morley of Holy Trinity Parish, has just died. On his chest, the telltale signs of plague, the black spots. His little brother is swept away from his mother's arms by men in white coats and hoods. He was to die in the pest house on the 5th of August, 1665. The Morley's house was closed, the door nailed shut, a red cross painted on it. The plague had arrived in Cambridge. Of course, Cambridge was no stranger to plague. Since the Black Death in 1348, it had experienced many outbreaks, the last being in 1646. By 1665, there were portents which suggested that it might return. And the statistically minded forecast it was likely to appear after 20 years. While Henry Moore, a tutor at Christ College, wrote to a friend in January 1665, I am afraid a great mortality is coming. The weather here is like April or May and there have been fiery meteors in the sky. And of course, the fiery meteor was the Halley's Comet. This was first observed in Cambridge in, on the 17th of December, 1664, and was described by Alderman Samuel Newton as a ray of light 20 yards in length. He saw it again on the 3rd of January, 1665. But not only was January unnaturally warm, but the unnatural heat continued. By the early summer of 1665, the river Lever in Cambridge had fallen, and the flies, a multitude of flies that lived on the inside of houses, a swarm of ants covering highways, winged and creeping everywhere, wrote William Boghurst, in a passage reminiscent of the biblical plagues of Egypt. The tightly packed streets of 17th century Cambridge continued to swelter and every day the sun shone. Um, I think you can probably remember summers like this quite recently. Uh, there should have been a map there. Um, <laughs> Carriers plying between Cambridge and London brought with them news of the plague from the capital. How long before it got to Cambridge? Tension grew in the town, and perhaps it was a relief when little John Morley was identified with the plague. At last, the waiting was over. It's easy to be inward looking and only consider the plague in Cambridge in 1665 and 1666. But we must not forget that the plague was being played out against the background of a war against the Dutch, which started in April 1665. And the effects of the war arrived in Cambridge on April the 6th, 1665, when a press gang arrived to press men for service in the Navy. 
Samuel Newton records that some 60 to 80 men were taken from the town to join the fleet at Harwich, as well as 400 men assembled from the countryside around. One of the pressmen was, was Newton's neighbour, John Sparks, the son of a local baker. Newton records that he returned unharmed from the war and Newton was to witness his will on, in 1683. The pressmen saw action on June the 3rd at the Battle of Lowestoft. Newton claimed that the guns of the battle could be heard in Cambridge all day long. <laughs> After plague was identified, the war faded into the background and the press gangs avoided pressing men from infected towns. When the plague was identified in Cambridge, the university and the colleges were still open as a great commemoration had just taken place. However, the university had a role to play in any plague outbreak. And the university vice-chancellor, Anthony Sparrow, and the town mayor, Francis V, signed the plague orders at the end of July. And um, these are the plague orders um, received from the Privy Council, which swung in to action in an attempt to stop the spray spreading. All public meetings were banned. Starbridge Fair was cancelled. All streets and alleys had to be cleansed and bonfires of sweet-smelling herbs were to be placed at street corners. No dogs, cats or pigeons, thought to be harbingers of sickness, were allowed onto the streets on pain of death. Though, of course, by the 19th century, it was discovered that this was not the case, and of course it was the black rat that was the culprit. And here is the cat, black rat. And of course the question is, was the black rat um, innocent? Because quite often um, there have been discussions that it wasn't the black rat that carried the plague. The orders decreed that where possible, the infected were to be isolated in a pest house. At this time, Cambridge had four sets of pest houses at Gonville Place on Midsummer Common and Jesus Green and the better known set on Coldham's Common. These have been left to decay after the last eight outbreak of plague. In, but in 1658, the town and the university decided that these should be repaired or rebuilt just in case of another plague epidemic. The sheds on Coldham Common were to be the model for this. And um, for 17th century buildings, um, these were um, quite good condition. Timber frame buildings faced with brick, each building containing two rooms with a brick chimney and a hearth with a bar across for cooking pots. Each room was to have a lockable door and a shattered window. The cost of the rebuilding came to a hundred, 189 pounds, one shilling and ninepence. But despite this expenditure, on the 22nd of November, 1663, the corporation noted that many of the pest houses were still in bad condition. Um, ju just a little bit about the Jesus pest house, because I was always doubtful about a pest house on Jesus Green. But following the last time I gave this talk in Histon, um, a gentleman came up to me and said, during the war, when they were building um, army emplacements on Jesus Green, um, a pit of over 60 bodies was found, which um, does point to this being a plague pit. Um, the bodies, the skeletons were then taken off to the Department of um, Anthropology, and the, the then professor would not let anyone except himself examine them. Um, when he left, it was discovered that these were all in cardboard boxes um, and in very bad decay, so they were taken off to Addenbrooke's and burnt. But um, f fairly obvious that this was a plague pit that they, they dug up. 
that few survived entering a pest house, and a 17th century commentator described it as pest houses as a slaughter for mankind. And th this um, is a uh, 19th century impression of a pest house. Um, the 19th century um, illustrations being used in this talk um, come from the Wellcome Institute um, of History of um, Medicine. There was no cure for the plague in the 17th century. Although the re various remedies were tried, some herbal remedies, smoking and chewing tobacco, were seen as preventatives, or carrying an amulet or, po or pomander stuffed with clothes, taking Venetian treacle. That's a plague doctor. Where's my... This is who um, the person... Um, this is an Italian print of um, what the plague doctor looked like. Um, Venetian treacle was a very noxious mixture of chemicals, nothing like the treacle we know today. Or, as a last resort, catching a dose of clap. So some establishments did a roaring trade when plague was identified. <laughs> there were two types of plague. Bubonic, identified in 1894 as a bacillus fed by, spread by infected black rat fleas, and characteristic of bubonic plague were black spots on the body, swollen glands under the arms and in the groin, high fever and usually death by sepsis. The other type of plague was pneumonic plague, and this was spread from person to person by droplets from a cough or a sneeze. Sound familiar? <laughs> and from contemporary descriptions of the 1665-1666 plague, this was almost certainly bubonic plague, as physicians pre present at the time noted that there was little sneezing and coughing in plague victims as had been seen in former times. It's pneumonic plague that the nursery rhyme Ring a Ring of Roses all fall down refers to. And one of the characteristic of the pneumonic plague was a tendency of the infected in the early stages to dance and run about. And there should have been a, um, the dance of death there, but... Um, following the death of John Morley and his brother, plague began to spread through Cambridge. After the Morley brothers' death, the next plague victim was also a child, Anne Fisher of All Saints Parish. On August 10th, 1665, the Mayor and the Vice-Chancellor signed the first plague bill of mortality. At this point, the university was still open although a notice from the corporation prohibited all public meetings within the town and the university. Although the university itself was still open, the college statutes allowed colleges to send all fellows and students home, and the fellows were allowed to keep their stipends when they moved out of Cambridge, which is a good thing. But to change the university term dates, Council lectures, exercises, and sermons at Great St. Great St. Mary's Church needed a university grace ordinance to be approved by the House of Regents. Throughout the many plague epidemics in Cambridge, there is often a mismatch between the closure of the university and the colleges. But one university member was compelled to stay on in Cambridge, the Vice-Chancellor, as with the town's mayor, he was needed to sign orders, organise relief for the poor and those stricken with the infection. In 1665, the colleges closed in July, but the university was not dissolved until the 10th of October 1665, when the appropriate grace was passed. 
The reason for this may be the election, have been the election of a new Vice-Chancellor, as in the 17th century, he was elected annually and he was always a, 17th, uh, a man in the 17th century. As plague took ho firm hold on the town, colleges became deserted. Jesus College gave all fellows leave to depart, but three op opted to remain, and college servants living in town and became, who became infected were given charitable allowances. Other fellows and students from across the university departed, and of course one was Isaac Newton, then a student at Trinity College. He went back to Woolsthorpe in Lincolnshire, and in later life his nephew claimed that it was while he was there that the apple fell from the tree <laughs> and the theory of gravity was discovered. Henry Moore of Christ College shows the concerns of the college fellows as to when they should leave. As early as 29th of June, 1665, he wrote to his patroness, Lady Conway, if Pegg was identified in the town, he would only be free to travel once all college business was over. And once Pegg was identified, he set off to Ragley Hall in Warwickshire, where he stayed until November. One fellow, fellow remained in Clare College while the rest of them departed, and three remained in Emmanuel College, and three women were given permission to live on the premises to care for them. Two bedmakers and a laundress who were given their own chamber. So this was a real departure for the women to actually come and live in the college. However, it's from one of the fo fellows who remained in Emmanuel College that we get some idea of what it was like to live in Cambridge at this time. John Tillotson wrote to William Sancroft, the college master who had moved to Tunbridge Wells, death stares us continually in the face. In every infected person that passes us by, in every coffin to put us in mind of our mortality. Where had the plague came fr come from? Was it the fault of the Dutch, the French, drunkards, the poor, or the sins of mankind? The first three plague victims in Cambridge were all young, innocent children who could not be held responsible for the sins of mankind. But the fourth victim, Rose Banks of Holy Trinity Parish, perhaps could be held responsible. For the 17th century, she was verging on elderly and she had a long and chequered career, baptising at least two illegitimate sons. Her death was followed by that of Richard Lawrence, also of Holy Trinity. He lived in a cottage roughly where W.H. Smith's is today. He was buried on the 11th of August, leaving his wife Ellen and baby daughter Sarah locked up in the cottage for 40 days. The next parish to be affected was St Clement's by the river. The first person to, people to be identified as plague victims there were a group of teenagers whose baptisms can be traced in the parish register. The first to die on the 15th of August was Jacob King, aged 14. He was apprenticed to a shoemaker, David Bowen, but still living with his father. Now today, um, teenagers tend to congregate in places such as bus shelters and so on, or they say used to, where if you go out at night, you see little <laughs> groups of them. So I like to think um, that on the Sunday evening of August the 13th, these teenagers, Jacob and his friends, gathered on the Great Bridge to gossip, scoff at passers-by, hold horses for those in frequenting, frequenting the inns on Bridge Street and drink ale or cider. Those on the bridge probably included the Porston brothers, Daniel, Samuel and Luke. 
their big sister Alice, age 15, and their brother, her brother John, aged 11, and seven-year-old sister Anne. Grace Gilbert, and a mystery girl, a mystery to the other teenagers because she'd only just arrived in St. Clement's with her father. All of these teenagers and children were to die of the plague. The Paulston family were locked in their house until one after another died, until the house was deserted. And at the end of 40 days, the beds, bedding, clothes and soft furnishings were taken out and burnt, and the house fumigated with lime and pitch. Between the 10th and 25th of August, the bills of mortality show there were 17 burials, but only five of these in Cambridge were plague victims. For the same period in London, there were 538 burials, of which 366 were plague victims. On August the 24th, the corporation cancelled the election for a new year and a um, new mayor and all civic festivities. The bill for the 14th of September listed 16 plague burials, eight in St. Clement's Parish, six in the Pest House, and two in St. Andrew's the Great's Parish. The first two victims in St. Andrew's were Jonas Bailey and his three-year-old son, George. They lived in a house leased from his father, George, who was a Burgess and a freeman of the borough. They were not an impoverished family from a poor section of the town, but a family of well-to-do tradesmen. By mid-September, St. Clement's had become the epicentre of the plague, with at least seven houses closed up. John, the son of Henry Gunnell, landlord of the Blackamoor's Head, died and the inn was closed. It was owned by Peter Lightfoot, a local fishermonger, and closing the inn meant loss of income for him, loss of employment for the inn's potmen, ostlers, cooks and servants. The plague was an economic disaster as well as a personal tragedy for those who lost loved ones. The Bullens, an interrelated family of hat makers living on Halston Lane, died and their business failed. There was another flurry of deaths in St Clement's during October, with 15 more houses closed up and the churchyard was becoming full. <coughs> Have a look at St Clement's churchyard next time you go past it and you'll see it, it's many feet above the road and think why this might be. The plague spread across the, the river to St Peter's Parish and this was a small parish with very limited resources and it seemed it had no option but to send their infected par parishioners to the pest house and save the cost of appointing watchmen to stop those infected escaping from their houses. All of its plague victims were unnamed, but listed as buried at the pest house on the green, eight in August, 12 in September, 1665, and the plague had also settled in St Giles Parish by that time. Now if you think about autumn in Cambridge, it's usually an exciting time as the university reopened Students returned, civic year commenced with elections, processions and feasts, but none of these took place in the autumn of 1665 as the plague spread inexorably. In October, it was identified in Holy Sepulchre Parish, the round church. This was a small parish, but with wealthy residents. Peter Dent, the apothecary, lived in a house which probably backed on to the churchyard. 
Next to him was Alderman T Thomas Tifford, his neighbour, west of the sign of the Swan, and another alderman, John Owens, a chandler, lived next to him. The victims at Holy Sepulchre show the plague travelling from household to household and through families and neighbours. Annis White and her sister Mary Fawcett in neighbouring households were buried on the 2nd of October and another um, neighbour and kin, also called White, died on the 19th of October. The bills of mortality for October have the preamble, all colleges, God be praised, are found to have continued without any infection of the plague. Now this was being quite economical with the truth, as William White, the fellow of Clare College, who'd stayed on in the college, wrote to a friend in Cambridge, in London, um, who had left town, plague had broken out in Christ College and Mr Bunchley was dead. Now William Bunchley, was in charge of college provisioning the college and issuing contacts for work. And his will shows that he was a very wealthy man. Now, if you go to the archives of Christ College, um, there is actually have evidence that the college was infected with plague because they had the mummified bodies of two black rats in a glass case. Very nasty to look at. And these were discovered under the floor of the Master's Lodge when it was being rebuilt. Physicians tended to flee when the plague was identified, but apothecaries stayed put. They could not cure the plague, but they could offer herbs and salves, ointments and drinks to serve, soothe the afflicted and alleviate the pain. One of those who stayed in Cambridge during the plague was Peter Dent, the apocryphy of Holy Sepulchre, and he was a native to the town. He'd attended Trinity College, but he was also involved in civic affairs, acting as inspector of tobacco at Starbridge Fair and Midsummer Fair. And when he died in 1689, he was described as a university reader in physics. Two other apocryphies in the town stayed through the plague. Artemis Hind in St. Giles Parish and William Frisby in St. Edward's Parish. Uh, and he was a neighbour and friend of Samuel Newton and mentioned in Newton's will. Winter beckoned and with it came a cold spell and it was hoped that this would cause the plague to abate. But on December the 10th, it turned warm and muggy, and the plague cases began to increase again. There were now houses shut up on the quayside and in Portugal Place in St Clement's Parish, and the November bills of mortality list 20 unnamed victims from St Peter's buried at the Jesus Green Pest House. As 1665, Drew to an end, there were at least 56 houses closed in Cambridge and about 250 men, women and children affected by this. So th this is um, a winter scene that probably some of you can recognise the painting that this is in from. As Christmas approached, there was a hard frost, and again, it was hoped it would deter the plague. Now, Christmas in late 17th century Cambridge was a religious event. In 1662, Samuel Newton described taking communion in his own parish of St Edward's on Christmas morning, and then joining a procession of aldermen to Great St Mary's to hear a sermon in the afternoon. It was not until the evening that some festivities occurred, when the wassail woman, with a bowl of wassail, came and sang carols to his household. In London, at the same time, Samuel Pepys had a, a brave plum pudding, a roasted pullet, and mince pies. He then added, 
his wife did not make, start to make her Christmas pies until December the 26th. In 1665, Christmas in Cambridge was a sombre affair. Few ventured out, and the automatic procession was cancelled. The university should have reopened in January, but the vice-chancellor sought permission from the Earl of Manchester, the university chancellor, and the king to delay the opening. On the 19th of February, the king gave permission for the university to remain closed until the first Sunday in Lent and stated that in effect of such another crisis, such as the plague, this would be the custom and would not need a royal letter. There were five plague deaths in January and February 1666 and then it looked as if the, plague were, the town were plague-free. Optimistic that this was the case, the university placed an advertisement in the London Gazette of the 19th to the 22nd of March, 1666. This place is now, God be praised, free from infections, not one here having died these six weeks, so that all return hither will be received and we hope without danger. Upon which, upon which confidence the first acts for Bachelors of Arts is appointed for the 2nd of April and the latter for the 26th of April. And so surely the worst was over. March continued dry and cold, but April came in warm and close. However, a warm spring meant a good harvest and things looked good for the future. In London, this was not the case, and the plague still raged. And because of this, the king cancelled Midsummer and Starbridge fairs again, for fear of spreading the infection of which Cambridge is now clear. This statement was far too optimistic. In June 1666, the plague reappeared in Cambridge, this time in St Botolph's Parish, the plague was identified first in what is now Penny Farthing Lane. I'm, I'm sure you all know this area, that you can picture um, these houses and what the place looked like. In the 17th century, Penny Farthing Lane had two rows of houses, one backing onto the churchyard and plus a yard at the end. The first to die of plague were the Ellingworth sisters, who had moved to Cambridge with their father in 1664. Both sisters died, and when their father emerged from the stricken house, he was penniless and applied for poor relief. So he was given four shillings and one penny to tide him over. Once again, students and fellows packed their belongings and departed. College gates were closed and locked. The market stood empty. And one by one, the red crosses started to appear again. The plague spread to St Andrew the Great Parish, where between 12th and 22nd of June, 13 plague deaths were recorded. Many of these were in a row of houses, adjoining houses, where the Hignalls, Pates and Squires lived and died. Next door to the Pates was Nicholas Boos, a say weaver. Um, say was an expensive light woolen cotton fabric used for tablecloths and bed covers. Nicholas Boos weaved this with his son and his wife and daughters teased and spun the wool. When his wife fell ill, Nicholas made his will, leaving his household goods to be divided between his wife and children. When probate was granted for this will on the 2nd of March, 1667, all but one of the legatees was dead. The rash of red crosses continued in St Andrews and spread back to Holy Trinity. The first death there, recorded in 1666, was for John Bowles, aged 26. The Bowles were an impoverished family 
exempt him from paying taxes and making a living picking up work where they could. Where they could. The rash of red crosses in Holy Trinity had now sped, spread to the poorer end of the parish. On 23rd of June, 1666, Samuel Newton moved with his family to Waterbeach. He was following the example of many who could afford lodgings away from the town or had relatives or friends where they could stay. We do not know where the Newtons stayed while in Waterbeach or what they did, but that village stayed clear of the plague. In neighbouring Landbeach, Although there is no mention of the plague in the parish register, between June and August 1666, there were 16 burials, where usually there were only two a month, which suggests an epidemic of some sort. Those burials included William Mead, a stranger, two old ladies, Amy Brightmer of Norwich and Margaret Potto, of Cambridge, all incomers who had probably brought the plague with them. And tradition says they were incarcerated in what is now known as the Plague House in, in Land Beach, um, which has now been remodelled and um, but is still there. The families that escaped the plague in 1665 now begun to succumb. Peter Lightfoot, the family, the fishmonger who owned the Blackmore public house, lost his, his family was affected from the 6th of June, August 1666 to the 23rd of October, where eight members of his family and household died, with only Peter, his wife Joyce, and his son Peter surviving. But in March 1667, they baptised a baby girl, and in June 1668, a baby girl. However, Lightfoot struggled to retain his lost trade and his place on the city council, and it took him until 1688 before he was made an alderman. In Cambridge, the summer of 1666, the situation was growing worse. There were 25 plague deaths and 11 people in the pest house listed in the bills of mortality for the 26th of June to the 3rd of July. Plague had been identified in St Andrews, Holy Trinity, St Bennet and St Bottles parishes. The following week, there were 44 to plague, plague deaths and a further 13 in the house pest houses and 77 plague deaths the week after. A walk down Jesus Lane was especially harrowing Six houses and a block were closed, and where there were small cottages and overcrowded, divided tenements, the plague spread like wildfare. <coughs> Those who died included Susan Turner and Elizabeth Claxton and their children, deserted wives whose husband may have been pressed men in the serving in the Navy, and in one tenement block, 14 children died as well as widows and the elderly. This led to some seeing that the overcrowded, unhygienic conditions suggested that the poor had brought this on themselves. The more rational pointed out that one of the common dung dunghills stood at the top of Jesus Lane, hard by these tenements. And of course, everyone knew that the plague was spread by bad smells and must be a cause of plague deaths. There were at least four common dunghills in Cambridge at that time. Um, I don't think there was one over this way, but there were definitely some very elite houses that built on where the common dunghill was <laughs> in some places. No, argued others, it was the way in which the poor lived, their behaviour and morals that brought the plague down on them. The editor of the Broad Street, the News, wrote, the plague is in the slushish parts of the parish where the poor are crowded together and the multitude infect one another.
was the plague in Cambridge a disease of the poor? There's no way of knowing who was on poor relief and classed as poor at the time. But where the occupations and status of the plague victims have been traced, it shows that the plague was no respecter of persons, wealth or status. Craftsmen, merchants, lawyers, aldermen and gentlemen all succumbed to the plague. But what the plague also did was to create um, new classes of people that needed relief, um, such as deserted the wives and the elderly um, and the orphan children. So, for example, um, when Robert Absalom of Great St Mary died of plague, um, he left in July 1666. Um, his wife had already died. So his orphan children were taken into the care of the parish and lodged in Coton, Cherry Hinton and Little St Mary Parish. They were given new clothes and shoes were provided for them. And when his son reached the age of 12, he was apprenticed to John Clement of Vintner, the parish paying the apprenticeship fee and providing more new vestments. And two years later, his sister Susan was also apprenticed by the parish. At the other end of the scale, when the wealthier members of a parish were stricken with the plague, they hastily either dictated their last wills or just produced these on scraps of paper. The three adult children of Benjamin Lord, a college cook, all caught the plague and all left notes about how their goods should be distributed. These claimed they were all sound of mind but sick in body and they left all, all three of them left their property to their uncle Edward Potto. So that is more evidence that Margaret Potto took the plague um, to Land Beach. The notes were witnessed by William Richardson and Marjorie Wisdom, obviously their students, who were then shut up in the house with them, and William Richardson was also to die of the plague. August 1st, 1666, was deemed a day of national fast and prayer against the plague, but it had not finished with Jesus Lane yet. It wiped out the whole Reader family who lived next door to Dr William Floyd at 4 Jesus Lane on the site now known as <coughs> Little Trinity. St Clement's, the epicentre of the sickness in 1665, was clear in the early summer of 1666, was hit again when Grace North, the wife of Samuel North of Portugal Place, died, which, of course, Portugal Place um, still exists. Um, again, like Penny Fathering Lane, in the 17th century, there was another row of houses um, backing onto the churchyard. And the lane um, from there led to a pasture planted with trees, probably willows or perhaps an orchard. And the master of St John's dovecote, six fish ponds, and then onto the King's Ditch. Um, the King's Ditch was then filled, was by then, was filled with rubbish. Um, and in the hot summers of 1665, 1666, could have contributed to the plague. By the end of August 1666, every parish in the town was infected, but some life went on as normal. Between the 8th of July 1666, 26th of September, 27 babies were baptised. But some were orphaned almost immediately. For example, Henry, the son of John Leet and Elizabeth Leet, baptised in Holy Trinity Church on the 10th of September, 1666, lost his father to plague on the 23rd of September. And during the plague, people still fell in love. The evidence for this comes from the 33 marriages that took place in the winter of 1666 and 1667, once the plague had ceased. Some of these marriages were between spouses 
where one partner had been incarcerated in a plague house. An example of this is Thomas Redhead, an apprentice scrivener who spent weeks incarcerated in a plague house as members of his family died, not knowing if his sweetheart, Mary Priest, was alive or dead. She was alive and he survived and they were married on the 27th of February, 1667. And the, um, sorry, I can't read this. I've got my. By the summer of 1666, the plague had, the town had reached a critical point where it had been in other plagues. With the colleges and the university closed, the town's main employers. Those previously employed fell into poverty and with little produce coming into town, famine looked likely. Help was needed from outside. And an advertisement was placed in the London Gazette by Francis Wilford, the then university vice-chancellor, asking for charity from well-disposed people for the relief of the poor in Cambridge, much visited by the sickness. In another for earlier plague epidemic um, in 1630, um, the same thing happened, but this time a brief or a letter um, was read out in every parish church asking for um, relief for the poor people of um, Cambridge. And this time, um, all the list of everything was collected and where it came from and how much and was sent to the university. So we know that in 1630, over um, 2,000 pounds was collected um, from towns and villages and counties, and often count, um, towns which were actually affected themselves. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have the same information um, for 1666. Although Cambridge had the trappings of a town, a corporation, civic ceremonies, high density of population and a variety of goods and services, it was still wedded to agriculture. Burgesses grazed cattle and sheep on Midsummer Common and Co Fen. Grain was taken from the fields to be um, milled in the King's Mills, Chesterton Mill, Newnham Mill. And anyone who climbed to the leads of King's College Chapel in August 1666 would have seen the town surrounded by a sea of wheat dotted by islands of pasture. And by mid-August, the corn in the fields surrounding the town was ready to be harvested, but there was no labour. A group of six men who leased land on Barnwell Field met at the Brazen George to decide what to do and what they were prepared to offer above a normal harvest rate of one shillings and sixpence a day to entice labour. They decided on two shillings and sixpence a day. But a rumour managed to get to London and it was reported in the state papers. At Cambridge, the plague is so short, saw that the harvest can hardly be gathered through, gathered though seven shillings a day is offered. <laughs> so fake news even in the 17th century. Sunday the 2nd of September was warm and dry in Cambridge. In London it was too warm and dry and the city burst into flames. The news of the Great Fire of London did not reach Cambridge until 9th of September and Samuel Newton, who had not written in his diary for a long time, felt compelled to add a, an account of it in his diary. The cull by the plague continued in September. 25 more houses were closed. 32 more plague deaths counted. On 23rd of September, the corporation renewed the order forbidding public assemblies. 
As September continued, the air grew moist and sowing seed for next year's harvest was threatened. On the 30th, there was a great storm with furious winds blowing and October came in with floods. The cam overflowed, the fens were sheets of water and cold rain fell. There were 36 further plague burials in Cambridge and plague had then reached Impington um, into the north. But in London, the plague was abating and although the roads were quagmires and traffic difficult, communication between London and the capital resumed and slowly the plague was disappearing in Cambridge. On the 26th of October, Samuel D Newton decided it was safe to return to his house in St Edward's Parish. There were eight plague deaths in the first week of November and there were still houses shut up with red crosses and still the fear of infection in the town. And in November, the animosity between the town and the university reappeared when a bill going through Parliament about orders for should provisions in case another pandemic should arise placed the m town's mayor um, in front of the university vice chancellor um, which created some fuss and at committee stage it was agreed the two should be reversed but the bill never became law at last in the final week of december the builds of mortality triumphantly declared that the town was clear of plague. The final toll deaths, um, the, 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 this is the December, this is the final toll of the, the plague. Um, so life could return to normal. Inns and cookshops could reopen. Neighbours could meet and gossip and children could play in the streets and noise came back to what had been a silent town and the market resumed. So the final toll of plague deaths in Cambridge was 920 recorded burials in churchyards and the pest houses. And although this was nothing like the 2,000 deaths in Colchester or the 100,000 in London, it was 12% of the town's population. Now, remarkably, the bills of mortality recalled 384 people infected with the plague who recovered. Probably they were misdiagnosed as the first symptoms were flu-like, but even those suspected would have been sent to the pest house or shut up in their own houses. In all, about... 1,304 individuals were directly affected by the plague, to say nothing of their household, kin and friends. The statistician, William Petty, suggested that in London, the city would make up the loss of population within two years, and that seemed to be true. But in smaller towns like Cambridge, the population remained lower than it had been before the, the plague. Between the 1664 half-tax return and the 1674 half-tax assessment, there was a fall of 14% in the number of houses assessed. A multiple of, per household of 4.5 suggests a population of about 8,700 8, in the town before the plague, but 7,500 after. And this figure is confirmed by a church census taken by Bishop Compton in 1676, which suggests an even lower figure of 7,000. Some parishes were very badly affected. For example, the number of assessed houses in St Andrews the Great fell by 27% in 1674. But behind these figures, there were people 70% of the plague victims in Cambridge were adults, whereas in Colchester and Norwich, they were more likely to be children. In Cambridge, 41% were men 
and 49% women, often young single women who had probably come into town looking for work in the colleges and inns. 29 families in Cambridge were completely wiped out. 17 husbands were left to look after children and 10 wives and children left without a breadwinner. These were spaces at the hearth which could never be filled. This was the last great outbreak of plague in England. Why did it disappear? There are various arguments for this. The Great Fire of London killed off the black rat population. It was an infection that could not compete with smallpox or, smallpox or tuberculosis. Towns were cleaned up and improved by Acts of Parliament. Soap became cheaper, so people were less likely to harbour fleas. However, it is likely that part of the population in the 1660s had built up an immunity or antibodies to the plague, fire infection and recover from the plague in 1630s and 40s. And recent research has shown that immunity to the, pl to the plague can be embedded in the genes. This is gene, CCR532, is caused by a historical event such as the plague. So if you have this gene, you have an ancestor who caught and survived either the Black Death or the Great Plague. And I'll very quickly um, say how I put all this together because in Cambridge um, we are lucky with the number of 17th century sources available. The first source I used was the registers for the Cambridge parishes <coughs> and these included lists of plague burials, sometimes marked P, um, sometimes pestis, or perhaps at the start of the list, here the infection began. This provided names. Numbers came from the Cambridge Bills of Mortality, which appeared during the plague. The 1665-1666 um, bills are in the university archives, but at least one set is, uh, one, one set is in one college archives. The university registry guard books, act books and will registry of fellows, as well as the commis commissary books, provided item uh, background on items such as Starbridge Fair. College lease books were invaluable. These gave the names of the leaseholder and also usually the names of whoever was living either side as well. And um, the place to start tracking down where which college owned which property in Cambridge um, during the 17th century is actually a 19th century Royal Commission on the Universities of Oxford and Cambridge, um, which went through and uh, sorted all these leases out. Well, the leases helped me to place people and streets and the 1664-1665 hearth packs to find, find out how many hearths they had, confirm who their neighbours were and if they were exempted from paying as being too poor. The corporation lease book also has in information on leaseholders and the corporation common day book on actions taken in the plague. There are also church wardens and poor reliefs accounts. Sa Samuel Newton's diary is invaluable about life in Cambridge before, after and during the plague. And other diarists such as Samuel Pepys and John Evelyn also provided background. And especially useful was the diary of Ralph Jocelyn of Earl's Colm because he gives lots of long details about weather at the time. Um, letter writers, contemporary com commentators on the plague, um, such as William Boghurst and Nath Nathaniel Hodges, and of course the maps on the town. Well, all in all, it took um, two years to compile the material before starting to write it up, and so I own thanks to many individuals in libraries and archives for their help. So thank you for listening.
you very much, Peter. That was um, quite an eye-opener for me. Um, so I now have discovered what that little P is by the side well, of oh, some in the name. parish register. <laughs> parish register. <laughs> I've often wondered. Um, so are there any questions from Sean? Oh, I'll just close my glasses. <laughs> Yes. Um, well, they, they would have been. They would have relied on people um, getting food and stuff that they could come through the windows. Um, if they got any coins, then they put it in vinegar, um, which is supposed to disinfect the coin. Um, it was decided once the plague had been identified, that was it. Um, watchmen would come. Um, the parish constable uh, would come and um, nail you up and um, put the big red cross on. So the houses were empty? No. So they were empty houses when they no. were destroyed? No, so no, they're all in there. People are in there. Yeah. Um, I think it was a question of, um, did they just go to the pest houses at the beginning? But, I mean, they must have got full very quickly, so then they must have decided they couldn't, they'd have to use the home. Be well, there. really, right from the start, they were um, using homes, but yeah, pe yeah. pest houses, um, because the, the plague order said they should go in the pest house, and therefore um, they tried to get as many people in the pest house. Um, what, what was supposed to happen was that um, each house was to ha supposed to have two watchmen to stop people infect um, ex with infection escaping, um, one in the, for the night and one for the day. Um, this would have been a colossal expense. No parish and the town could not have afforded that. So I think um, the, the houses were shut up and just left and you um, did as what you could. And, and then um, the dead could, um, because you probably heard the bring out your dead. Um, well, that's Daniel Defoe, which um, he was not actually in the plague. But um, you can see that um, you would bang on the window and whatever and and um, ask for the door to be un, um, nailed so that you can put out the, the dead. Do you think the pride would stop people from leaving Cambridge because they might be infecting other areas outside of Cambridge? Or is that impossible to do? Of the population, like a small place in Derbyshire, actually stops people leaving and they decided themselves they wouldn't leave. Yes, um, no, there, there was n nothing to stop people leaving Cambridge, but when they got somewhere else, if they knew you would come from an infected town, then they would send you on, <laughs> sort of. But what, what is interesting, when um, people from London, when it was first identified, um, carriages flocked up um, the Old North Road and, and people, and so you can trace it, um, from town to town, um, all the way up to as far as Bulldog. So. Sorry. Oh, n no provision was made. It was uh, up to you to rely on um, friends, neighbours and so on, um, actually getting food and shoving it through your window. Um, so possibly some people could have died of starvation anyway. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> yes, in, in, the, in 1630, um, which was almost as bad as this, if not worse than 1666, 1665, um, people were dying of starvation. Um, the, they could not get any food and the gentry houses round would not let them out and there was a, a, a big spat between um, Sir Edward Hind at um, Maddingley and the University Vice-Chancellor because um, he complains that um, People troop out from Cambridge and trample his crops and take away his cattle and so on. Um, 
And uh, the vice chancellor sort of replies, well, what are they supposed to do? They've got nothing to eat here. Um, there was well, um, once again, thank you then. Um, and uh, I think we've got any questions for anyone else. Yeah, I don't know. Thank you. Oh, th thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.